So the whole of lighting and shading can't be learned in a 10 minute YouTube video. But I do have a few actionable tips you can start using right now to start you on the right path. I'm Abby Esparza with photomanipulation.com and today we're going to touch on the very tip of the light and shadow iceberg with a heavy emphasis on the shadow bit because there is a whole lot of stuff you need to learn, understand, study, and practice, but today's a good day to start at least playing with some of the tools and settings that I like to use when shading and creating shadows. There is actually a great little video I find super helpful for showing the relation of shadow and shape and light that I'll uh, link down in the description. First, here, let's talk brush settings. The shape is going to be nothing fancy. There's no magical pre-made brush that's going to make painting shadows easier because all you really need is the default round brush uh, to start and learn with, at least. Eventually, you may have preferences, but the default round brush is going to get you very, very far. Your size and hardness will both change depending on the shadow being cast. Uh, what we're going to focus on is the flow and opacity of the brush. More oftentimes, the not, I keep my opacity at 100% and just set my flow down to something super low, somewhere between 1 to 20%. This is just personal preference, however. So flow builds color up gradually, uh, laying more color with each pass of the brush. Opacity lays down a solid amount of paint, but with a limited opacity. Combine the two and you'll slowly build up paint until you reach the set opacity. Bringing us to the pen controls. Because yes, super sorry, but I do think you should get a tablet. However, you can get by with just a brush. Uh, tons of artists do it. I am just not that talented, so I always recommend a tablet. When painting shadows with a pen, which again for me is always, I like to have opacity pressure but not size pressure on. Just because I find that shadows end up looking less uniform with it on. You can always lower the threshold, but I like to keep size pressure off when painting shadows. Let's move on to color. Right off the bat, unless you're painting on a black and white image, you shouldn't be using black in your shadows. That's a one-way ticket to muddy or gray shadows. I touch on this a little bit in part two of my color guide, so I'll make sure to link that somewhere. So a really easy rule for picking shadow colors is that it's going to be a darker, less saturated version of the surface you're placing the shadow on. And since we work with photos, we can almost always just color pick a color from pre-existing shadows. I like to choose the second darkest shadow as my general color, and then I'll adjust that color as I paint. So for this model, the lower cheek or the shadows cast by the straps are both perfect. Keep in mind, the shadow color will only work on her skin. If the shadow being cast is also on her shirt, then I would use the undertone of her shirt. And even though her shirt is black, it does have an undertone, which is blue in this case. Blue in general is usually a really, really good color to use when placing shadows on a black surface. Here is a quick example. I have general shadows being cast in almost a gobo style of lighting. The shadows on her skin are tinted more brown, while the shadows being cast onto the wall are a bluish tinge. And really quick, you'll want to keep bounce light in mind. Shiny, glossy, glassy, or any partially transparent surfaces will cast a pretty significant bounce light of color into the shadowed areas. This will also depend on the surface the shadow is being cast onto, as well as the intensity of the light. A bit hard to keep brief, but this red here is a pretty good example. Let's move on to layer modes. So my ride or die layer mode for painting shadows is going to be multiply, with my least favorite being overlay. I'm going to create three new layers, a multiply layer, a soft light layer, and an overlay layer. With our chosen shadow color, I'm going to paint a quick line on each layer going over the brightest point of the model's face. Also lowering each layer down to 50% or so opacity. These shadows are obviously not being cast by anything specific. Um, I'm using 100% flow. We are just going to focus on how each of these layers interact with the subject. So notice how the multiply layer actually darkened the highlights. The soft light layer slightly darkened them, but not by much. And the overlay layer darkened them, but also created an almost 
color banding effect. That's because overlay adds contrast. It also adds saturation, both things you do not want in a shadow. I'm not a fan of soft light either, as it doesn't affect highlights, which a cast shadow will always do. And it also tends to add saturation, which again is a big no-no. You can always mix and match, but you still want to be mixing soft light or overlay with multiply. Let's go back to this leafy shadow image. This group just enhances what's already there, so let's turn that off. And let's just look at the body shadows, though the background shadows here are uh, set up the exact same. This top layer is set to a good old multiply, but it doesn't really do enough to, you know, kill those highlights. So to support the multiply layer, I duplicated the shadow and set the layer mode to darken. Layers set to darken will only affect areas that are lighter than the color being painted. Let's create a new darken layer and get a better view of what's happening. I'll use a brightness contrast layer so you can really see how differently it affects the layer based on brightness. And back to our portrait here, let's duplicate the multiply layer, change it to darken, and then lighten it so it's only affecting the lighter highlight and not darkening the already dark areas. Multiply and darken are a great shadow pairing. Just like you liking and subscribing to our channel is a pretty great pairing as well. Let's touch just quickly on the shape of shadows. This is where that video I mentioned can really come in handy because I'm just going to point out a few things. How light reacts with objects creating shadows is a complicated subject, but you can learn a ton just from actually looking at shadows and not just, you know, guessing. So right off the bat, notice how none of these shadows are shapeless blobs. Notice they are all consistent in direction. And notice how the physical distance from the strap affects the shadow. This is a big one. The closer it is to the surface, the sharper the shadow. The further, the softer, uh, but not shapeless in this case. Also, the closer the darker and the further the lighter, with the inner part of the strap casting more shadow than the edges. And finally, notice how shadows don't really overlap, they more so merge. Our multiply layer here will darken anything it touches, highlights and shadows. This can leave you with overly dark shadowy areas. Bringing us to a few extra tools that can help you with creating shadows. Starting with good old blend if. Double click on a layer to find the blend if settings. Use blend if to remove the multiply color from the already existing shadows. Hold alt to split and drag the toggles on the left, sliding each, watching the shadows until you like what you're seeing. Blend if is incredibly handy when working with shadows, with this just being one of its uses. I highly recommend playing with it as much as possible. And secondly, multiple layers. I already kind of touched on this by using you know, two different layer modes, but the best way to paint shadows in general is over the course of multiple layers. Creating a new layer whenever you jump up you know, softness is a great general rule to follow. So let's summarize. Color pick your shadows from already existing shadows. Shadows will be darker, less saturated, and hold less contrast. Multiply for life, say no to overlay. Build your shadows up slowly using both a low flow rate, brush opacity, layer opacity, and multiple layers. And finally, Blend If is a powerhouse that deserves its own video series. But at least in the meantime, just try and play with it. I do have a quick introduction to the Blend If tool that touches on how it works a bit more that I definitely think you should check out. That's it for today. I'm Abby Esparza with PhotoManipulation.com. See you next time.